Okay, guys, we'll get started. <clears throat> so, on Monday, we started to learn a few things about basically nucleation. Okay, we had a little bit of a look at um, uh, defining what kinetics and diffusion are with respect to real life processes, okay, and how these might lead to reactions, um, or the rates at which things might change within a reaction. And a reaction can be a chemical reaction, a change of state, something like this. Okay. We went on and um, looked at the two different cases that we can have for nucleation. Right, so homogeneous nucleation, and hopefully you remember homogeneous nucleation is the stochastic random nucleation of uh, the next or progressing phase or reactant um, <coughs> within the main body of material. And we also had a look at heterogeneous nucleation, which was where nucleation is uh, triggered at a site of lower energy, okay, uh, which assists in um, the forward reaction, okay, producing the reactants. Right? So a heterogeneous nucleation site, typically this could be uh, an impurity or foreign particle, okay, or a containment vessel, something like that. So we looked at some examples there, condensation, vaporization, effervescence, cavitation. Uh, we looked at the um, Mentos diet coke experiment, okay, where the Mentos were clearly acting as a heterogeneous nucleation site uh, for the um, evolution of carbon dioxide bubbles out of solution. Uh, instances of melting and crystallization. Inoculation, precipitation from a vitreous solid, and crystallization. And we kind of got to the recrystallization slide. We had a quick look there, but we might have a little bit more of a look before we get on to some more involved and in-depth analysis of how we can define nucleation. Okay, so we'll be looking at some classic nucleation formulas shortly. Okay, but the first example that we had on recrystallization okay, was the recrystallization of a rolled piece of aluminium. When we roll a piece of aluminium, okay, what happens is the grain structure of that um, ingot or billet of aluminium starts to get destroyed. We start inducing uh, defects into that structure. Those defects can be voids in the crystalline structure or vacancies, okay, or they can be dislocations, which you'll probably learn a little bit more about in detail as you go through the materials course. Okay. These, um, <coughs> these imperfections in the crystal structure can also act as nucleation sites okay, for an event called recrystallization. So in recrystallization, there's essentially no change of state. Okay. We're still precipitating the same phase, but we're precipitating it without these voids or vacancies or defects. Okay. So we're minimizing the structural energy of the material by recrystallizing new material that's free of any defects. It has a lower structural energy. Okay, so this happens every time we try to get internet in this place.
Okay, so let's have a look at this image here. We've got our rolled structure. Okay, so here's the remnants of our rolled structure. Ultra fine grain size. We've induced many, many defects with the crystalline structure. Many grain boundaries, which are also defect sites, sites for nucleation and growth of new crystals. Okay. You can see here, as we apply temperature, the grains in the material are recrystallizing and growing. Okay, so this is in a standard SEM. And we're just heating that stage, providing enough energy for diffusion of atoms. Okay. The atoms have given enough energy that they can start to move, rearrange themselves in a lower energy state. Okay, and they'll continue to grow as heat's applied. Here's another case, recrystallization of copper. Okay, you can see the fairly rapid transformation of deformed copper. You can often see twinning in the structure as well. Okay, so these are completely new grains, free of any deformation that are forming there once we've got enough heat for the atoms to move about. So essentially the nucleation point will be sites of the highest energy okay, that we've uh, created within the structure and the structure wants to minimise that energy so the atoms are realigned and start to grow a new grain. We will have a lecture set on recrystallisation coming up soon. I'll just hit pause here. Now this one here is the case where we're utilizing heterogeneous nucleation. All right? So in this sample, it's heavily deformed, but we've also got some foreign particles that we put in there on purpose. These are typically ceramic uh, particles or intermetallic particles within the material. Right? The matrix, okay, be it aluminium probably, all right, is highly deformed, so it's got a high energy. And as we apply heat, we can see that preferentially, and I'll hit pause again, the new grains are growing from those foreign particles. Okay. So those foreign particles are typically providing a surface okay, where nucleation is easier than within the body of the matrix of the material. Okay, so there's something about those particles that uh, makes the growth of a new crystal easier. Okay. So the surface of those particles, there might be a, a lattice plane orientation that's very, very favourable. Okay. There might be a chemical effect that's very favourable for atoms to realign and begin to grow a crystal from those surfaces. Okay. So that would be a solid state heterogeneous nucleation effect. Here we've got a TEM image okay, of a crystal. And we're looking at continuous static recrystallization of this crystal. We've also got a series of dislocations in here. So this is what a dislocation looks like underneath in a TEM. Okay? And we can see recrystallization of the material emanating from that boundary, which is essentially annihilating those dislocations as it goes. Here, we've got a grain that's growing under the TEM, and the strain associated with the growth of that grain is actually generating dislocations, okay? And a front, in a front, as that grain is growing in front of the grain interface. Okay, so these are all active dislocations that we can see in the TEM. So these are defects in the crystal structure. And the crystal that's growing, you see it's free of dislocations. This one's quite as clear, right, but here we have a foreign particle. This is again in the TEM, 
So very high resolution. Really seeing it much yet myself. Uh, we start to see recrystallization here occurring off of the interface between our particle and into our matrix. Okay, so those grains, new grains are growing preferentially from the surface of a foreign particle. So again, solid state heterogeneous nucleation. <coughs> right. so just a little note on growth and we won't be going into our growth lecture today we're going to finish up on nucleation because that's a little bit complex All right. but a little bit on growth before we kind of move into our next lecture set so once the phase transition has overcome the free energy barrier to nucleation uh, given appropriate conditions so driving force, temperature um, availability of uh, reactants Okay. Uh, a small embryo that has nucleated, okay, the nucleus of a new phase, is then subject to growth. So if matter is available for the growth of this phase, this generally involves the sequential addition of atoms, or molecules or ions to that nucleus to make it grow. Okay. And this will often occur in very specific locations or orientations. Okay. And again, this is actually uh, generally a diffusion-based process. Okay. Atoms have to move from point A to point B to rearrange themselves to generate the new phase, okay, or transit from one uh, state to the next. So yeah, generally this is an atom by atom process. It can happen very, very quickly, or it can happen quite slowly in an uh, ordered way. Okay, so just an example here. Um, this is some of the work that was done in our labs, uh, probably getting close to 10 years ago now where we've got the growth of crystals from a specific nucleation point, all right, or a substrate, uh, which can be highly directional. Okay? So when we have directionality in a material, what do we create? Often an isotropy. Okay? Sometimes it's preferable to have a material that's stronger in one direction uh, than another. Right? So that's possible using nucleation uh, and growth in particular directions. So the key here is often the energy associated with the placement of an atom okay, or molecule um, on a surface of something that's starting to grow is minimal on a specific crystallographic plane. All right. So if we think about our crystal structures, okay, hopefully you've learned a little bit about you know, your FCC, HCC and BCC structures. Each of those structures have crystallographic close packed planes. BCC is a little bit hokey. Okay. But the atoms are essentially closer together. So adding to a particular surface, for example, a close packed plane, is easier than a non-close packed plane. So hence, crystals like to put grow in specific directions related to those particular planes. In this work here, and again, this is metallic glass work. All right? So metallic glass, this is a vitreous solid material. All right? We rapidly cool it from the melt and it doesn't crystallize. Um, it's inherently a fairly brittle material, so what we want to do is put some nice ductile crystals in there to act as a composite effect. Okay, hopefully make these materials a little bit tougher. So what we've done in these materials, we've added a ceramic particle to our melt, liquid alloy. All right, this is Y2O3, yttrium oxide. It doesn't melt within our alloy melt. Okay, it just stays there as a particle. We can stir it in. And then we rapidly cool this melt. So what we produce is a microstructure where we've got this amorphous matrix. So this is a glassy metal here, no crystalline structure whatsoever, this light gray phase. But from these particles, and you can see that they are coming off in some very, very specific directions. There, that one there is a nice example. Okay, We've got a nice little cubic Y2O3 particle. We can see a phase growing very rapidly in one direction from that particle. That phase is actually alpha magnesium. Right. When we went and did some TEM on this particular sample, we zoom right in and have a look at that interface between the particles, the glass, and this crystalline phase. What we found was, okay, Y203's got this 
It's an FCC ordered super lattice. Okay, so you can kind of see here that these atoms are arranged in a certain way, a crystalline lattice. Okay. And as we move out from our particle, there's a very, very thin layer, okay, only 10, 20 atoms thick of copper, pure copper, essentially, that's added to the surface of that Y203. And what happens is the crystallographic plane of FCC copper is lining up perfectly with another crystallographic plane of the Y203. So that's a low energy site for the copper to actually deposit. And it does so preferentially as we're cooling. We've only got a little bit of copper in this alloy. Okay? So as soon as conditions are right, on top of that very, very thin layer of copper that's surrounding those particles, right, we're talking nanometers here, very, very small, the basal plane of magnesium, uh, sorry, one of the pyramidal planes of magnesium, the 1010 plane, okay, it's very, very low energy for it to deposit onto that plane of copper. Right. And it does so very, very rapidly. And because of this, these plates, and they're actually platelets in their shape, they look like needles here, but we're only looking in two dimensions. Okay. They grow very, very rapidly in that direction, right, producing this microstructure. This microstructure here is very, very good at blocking cracks through a material. Okay, so if you try to run a crack through here, it's going to get blocked and mitigated by a ductile crystalline phase. And that's how we've improved the toughness of this material. Okay, so that's an example. Heterogeneous nucleation growing in a very, very specific orientation with relation to the inoculation particles. But we see it in all kinds of things, okay? The most classic example are ice formations, snowflakes, okay? So the crystal structure of ice or water, okay, um, basically dictates the direction which crystals like to grow. Okay, and you can straight away see that there's a relationship here on some planes of 120 degrees or 60 degrees, okay? <coughs> and we can see that they're growing very, very quickly in some directions and very, very slowly in other directions. Okay. So again, this is due to the add-on process of those molecules finding a preferential direction for crystals to grow. Okay. So instead of forming a nice round crystal, we're always forming these long needle-like crystals. Okay. And as they get bigger, we see branching on other very specific crystallographic planes. Okay. Just because it's easier to add atoms in a specific direction to a crystal. What else have we got here? This looks captivating. Yeah, there we go. Straight away, you can see the directionality, 60 degrees. So we have this preferential growth directionality of crystal structures. So from our nucleation point, this decides to grow in some very, very specific hear people say no two snowflakes are the same uh, I call bullshit um, basically uh, from that seed we're very very limited in the directionality in which it can grow right? and many snowflakes fall every year and um, if we're based on these limitations of growth in specific directions there are going to be quite a few snowflakes that are the same okay. all right We'll just check this one out before we move on to nucleation. Classic nucleation. Okay, so now that's just a simulation of, <coughs> of growth. I don't think that's a very good example. All right. So the next thing we're going to look at is nucleation and growth theory. Okay, today specifically, classic nucleation and growth. All right. We've, we've been lucky to get about 30 of you here today, so fifth, sixth of the class. 
This little group of lecture slides here probably accommodates for more than one question in the final exam. So be glad you turned up today. <coughs> okay. So last time we learnt, nucleation is the first step in the formation of a new thermodynamic phase or structure. And nucleation is defined to be the process that determines how long we wait before the new phase appears. All right. So what are the basic thermodynamic principles behind nucleation? We've spoken about it a little bit. Okay. So energy. Okay. The energy associated with the event and the driving force, which is also related to energy. For that transformation. Okay. Transformation barriers or thresholds which are closely related to temperature, pressure, enthalpy and entropy. So it's starting to look like Gibbs equation. We've covered Gibbs in chemistry have we? Yeah, we're kind of familiar with that. G is equal to H minus T delta F, uh, TS and the differences between the two. Good. Okay, so on Monday we remember we looked at that um, example in the movie, all right, where we saw in the TEM this atomic scale event where the crystal was trying to melt. Okay? So the temperature of that crystal was very, very close, maybe just above the melting point of that material. And we were seeing a stochastic popping up of uh, local melting occur. Okay? So we had the nice um, ordered crystal lattice, and then we'd see this little zone of atoms starting to um, move about and melt amorphous but they'd pop up and then they disappear and they pop up over here and disappear and it wasn't until we kind of got two in close proximity where they were close enough to kind of join together and create a bigger zone where melting actually progressed and that's what we're going to be talking about today and some of the mathematics I guess okay or science thermodynamics behind it all right so some formulas and some charts so what we're going to do today is look at, first of all, the example of a liquid to solid transformation. Okay? So we've got a molten material, a liquid material, and we're going to solidify it. Okay? And the solidification process happens through, in the first instance, the nucleation of that new phase. Okay? So, back to Joey Gibbs' formula. All right? The free energies of a liquid and solid at a temperature T are given by these equations. Okay? So the free energy of the liquid is equal to the associated enthalpy of the liquid subtracted minus the temperature and the entropy of that state. All right? <coughs> and we can plot that. All right? So the free energy of our liquid versus temperature. We can plot free energy of the liquid which follows this line here okay it changes from this dotted line to this solid line so that is our plot essentially of free energy versus temperature of our liquid all right we've got the same thing going on for the actual solid okay the solid that we're intending to precipitate or transform into all right. and that's represented by this line here okay obviously they're different they're two different phases okay <coughs> what happens is okay at a particular temperature all right um, any given temperature we can then determine our delta G which is our difference between the free energy of the liquid and the solid makes sense it's a basic subtraction or difference okay so for this temperature here okay on this axis our delta G is essentially this here, this distance here, and our free energy plot. <coughs> okay, and this gives us our basic Gibbs uh, equation for when we are transferring between um, uh, uh, products and reactants or changes in state. Okay, delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Hopefully, we all know that one by now. However, at the equilibrium melting temperature, so TM, where this material decides to melt when it's given an infinite amount of time to do so. Okay, equilibrium melting temperature. Delta G is equal to zero. Yeah. So 
So at the melting point, Tm, delta G is equal to zero. And basically our transformation under equilibrium conditions follows this solid line, all right? So if we're cooling from the liquid state, say at high temperature, we're following this line. It has the lowest free energy on this axis, so that's the stable form. As we're cooling, our two lines cross over at the melting point, all right? And we start to follow this line here, which is the free energy of the solid. Okay, so below that point, under absolute equilibrium conditions, our solid has formed, all right? If we've got an infinite amount of time. Working with these equations, what we can see is delta S, okay, at the melting point, is equal to delta H over Tm. All right, because delta G is equal to zero. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Right. Another way of writing it or defining it is using this term here, LF. Okay, LF is called the latent heat effusion. All right. So if delta G is equal to zero, the only thing left is that latent heat effusion. Okay, the energy associated with that transformation. <clears throat> now, typically though, we do have this barrier to nucleation and growth. We don't often have the, um, the luxury of infinite time for transformation to occur. All right. What tends to happen in nature is we need this thing called undercooling. All right. And how undercooling works all right, is, um, we'll, go, we'll go through the equation I guess. So for small undercoolings, an undercooling is basically this delta T function here, all right? So what happens is as we're cooling in nature or in a real uh, lab event or something like that, we don't get this transformation instantaneously, okay? The driving force for the transformation is zero, okay? Or very, very low, then it might take a very, very long time to occur, even if we are below Tm, yeah? However, what we can see from this diagram quite clearly is, as we increase delta T, our delta G is getting bigger, yeah? What does delta G represent here? Delta G represents the driving force for crystallization, for solid solidification, all right? So if we're cooling very, very quickly, the further we get below the melting point that we haven't actually started to solidify or nucleate a new phase, right, the greater the driving force for forming is. Okay. And given this relationship, we can actually define delta G, our driving force for solidification, as being equal to the latent heat of fusion multiplied by our undercooling, delta T, divided by our melting temperature. Right. So basically, uh, delta G, this is usually generally a constant, okay, latent heat of fusion. Our Tm, uh, under equilibrium conditions, is a constant, okay, so delta G is directly proportional to delta T. Okay. So I'll say it again, thus the driving force for solidification is directly proportional to our undercooling delta T. And this equation is also applicable in the solid state when we go from one solid phase to the next solid phase. Okay? So I'll just, I'll go over it again because this is going to be important in the next few slides. Okay? And this is, students often get confused here. So here we've got our free energy lines for our liquid and our solid. The thing with the lowest um, free energy is what's going to be stable at a given temperature, okay? And that's what this solid line represents here. So above the melting point, the liquid's going to be stable. We pass through the melting point, okay? And then essentially, our solid's going to be stable. All right, so hopefully you can grasp that, all right? The key takeaway is delta T proportional to delta G. Delta G is the driving force for solidification or crystallization. Depends where you are relative to it. Okay. 
and it also depends on delta H. So this is just a general representation. But yes, um, <coughs> in a natural system, and you've got to think about um, thermal conductivity and all these kinds of things, something with a higher melting point is basically uh, more difficult to undercool. Okay? So the, sometimes in nature it's usually relative to room temperature or the temperature of your mould or, or whatever you're using. Anyway, but for just a general representation, okay, I, I think this equation here covers it. So this is, this is basically our um, delta H factor, okay, which is constant for a given system. So this is a chemical dependence. Yeah? And then we've got our undercooling and our melting point. Okay, so this is going to be constant. This is going to be constant. Delta G proportional to delta T. Okay. We get on to some of the metallic glass stuff a little bit down the track where we actually find that the free energy between the liquid and the solid are incredibly close together. And this is a chemical thing and a diffusion-based process there as well. Okay. So when delta G is very, very small, it's very easy to undercool much, much further. But we'll get on to that later. All right. Is everybody clear? And we'll go on to the next one because it's more equations and stuff. Okay. Now, to explain the process of nucleation and the growth of, our, growth of our new phase, okay, we use classic nucleation theory. Now, I'll tell you right now, classic nucleation theory is a very simplified version of what's really going on on the atomic scale. Okay. Many other different factors that have come into play here, right? But classically, we can define nucleation. Um, using this method. Okay. So what we do with our analysis here using classic nucleation theory, we start with this finite volume of liquid. Okay. So we've got so many cc's, cubic centimetres of liquid in our box. Right. At a temperature, delta T, okay, so this is at some undercooling below the equilibrium melting temperature, Tm, that we've just looked at, some of the atoms in the liquid start to cluster together to form a small, solid, and we're going to say spherical embryo. Right. So typically in nature, the sphere, a spherical shape, has got the lowest energy. Okay? It's got the lowest volume to surface area ratio, so it's a low energy structure, the sphere. This isn't always the case. Sometimes we get crude cubes growing, sometimes we get plates growing. But for this analysis, we're going to look at the sphere because it's the simplest form. So as we uh, decrease our temperature or increase our undercooling, the free energy of the system will change the nucleation of a solid from the liquid state. Okay? The change in free energy can be defined as follows. Okay? What we've got to keep in mind here that we've still got this finite amount of material in this box. Okay? We're not changing that part of the system. Okay? And essentially to form a solid, we're taking material away from the liquid. So the free energy of the system will change for nucleation of a solid from the liquid. The change in free energy, delta G, is given by this equation here. All right. So delta G is equal to negative Vs. Okay, so Vs and Vl are the volumes of the, um, the solid sphere and liquid. So here we're looking at volume of the solid sphere. This is negative because we're essentially taking material away from the liquid. VL minus Vs in terms of the volumes of things that are forming. Okay. We're also then multiplying by GV, all right. uh, delta GV. So this is the free energy of the solid um, and free energy, the difference between the free energy of the solid and the liquid per unit volume. Okay. So this is our free energy factor associated with the volume. Okay plus this other factor. Right? Now this factor here is associated with the surface area of the solid particle that's starting to form. Right? And it's multiplied by our gamma SL. Okay? And this is the solid liquid interfacial free energy. Okay? So if you think about the system, I'm starting off with a liquid. A couple of atoms decide to arrange themselves in an ordered way, which is the nucleus of our crystal. Now we have this interface between what is essentially a solid and the liquid. Right? With any interface, there is going to be an associated energy factor. Okay? Because they're different in structure. So for atoms to shift and start to build one phase being taken away from another phase, 
they have to move and realign themselves. Okay, and that's what gamma ASL is representative of. So what do we have overall? We've got a volume factor multiplied by an energy factor. And we've got a surface area factor multiplied by another energy factor. Okay. So we know from the previous slide for a given undercooling, delta T, delta GV is given as our latent heat of fusion multiplied by our delta T over Tm. Again, we're going to go back to this sub assumption of using a sphere. Okay. So basically, we can figure out okay, via uh, this type of equation and the geometry of our um, sphere or our embryo, okay, um, the basis of minimum surface free energy results in a spherical embryo. So we can rewrite our equation one as okay, delta G R in terms of the radius of our spherical embryo is equal to our volume factor multiplied by the radius, etc. Okay, by our energy factor, plus again our surface area factor, starting to put numbers to it, multiplied by the energy associated with having that surface area. So what we get is essentially a combined plot of two factors. All right. This one here, we'll start with this one here. Okay. This little plot here in terms of our change in free energy, our delta G. Remember, we want this to be negative or as low as possible for a reaction to proceed, basic chemistry or change of state. Okay. So our volume factor, as we increase the radius of our particle, obviously we're increasing the volume okay, of the solid. And again, we've got this negative out the front, which is driving this curve downwards. Yeah, it's more negative territory. So as the volume of that little spherical embryo grows, Okay. the energy and the driving force associated with getting it to grow and continuing to grow increases. So as it gets bigger, it wants to grow faster and faster based on its volume. However, we've also got this constraint okay, of this solid-liquid interfacial free energy. This is a positive factor multiplied by the surface area. Okay. And that's represented by this curve here. And you can see here that it's driving our free energy upwards into more positive territory. So it's trying to stop the growth of our spherical embryo <laughs> as it's getting larger. Right. So we've got this trade-off between volume and surface area as this thing's trying to grow. Right. And that's what we were seeing in that movie, those stochastic events of you know, that liquid phase trying to grow and then it's getting pulled back and it's trying to grow over here and getting pulled back very close to the melting point. And not until we had two regions there that were able to form a larger volume were we able to, able to overcome this interfacial free energy to let it grow. And that's what this white curve is here. So this is the combination of those two curves. And what we find is, in terms of our radius, going back to this equation here, as we get bigger, okay, we can see up to a certain point, our free energy is positive, or becoming more positive relative to the size of our particle. Okay? So what's happening, unless we can kind of approach and exceed that critical radius, randomly or stochastically, we're always going to be trying to push that particle back into solution, all right? based on our delta G. Remember, delta G is proportional to delta T. Right? But we do hit a critical radius of that nuclei. Once it gets to a certain size, it's all downhill. Yep. So once we hit our R star value, our critical radius of that spherical particle, okay, and this critical driving force for homogeneous nucleation, these things start to appear, they become stable, and then they can start to grow. Okay. So that's basically the crux of classic nucleation theory. And that's why at the melting point we do see this stochastic growing and shrinking of our next phase or our next state. Right. Yeah? The, the YSL, is that like a material property or is that based on like the different crystal structures? So, <clears throat> actually a pretty good question and we'll get on to the solid solid. But yeah, it is, it is a structural and to an extent a chemical factor as well. 
Okay, so depending on what species is trying to add on to that surface, yeah. Liquid to solid, it's not so much an issue with the structure because the liquid has no structure. Okay, so the, the interfacial free energy there is pretty low. Okay, but then we've also got this chemical contribution as well, whether it does want to add on at a specific site or, or something like that. Okay, so it is, it is both. And it can also be topological as well. Okay, again, associated with the structure. Okay. <clears throat> So we've gone over this, we've got our two factors here. Okay, so this is this really is key to the examination, guys. This is something you've really got to learn because most of question two is basically this, this slide set. All right. Okay, so we can also come up with some other relationships um, to generally tie certain factors to this event of nucleation and growth, okay? So we can define what our critical radius is just by back substituting through that formula, okay? Equation one, okay? So our R star value is gonna be equal to two times gamma SL over delta GV, okay? So if we actually know these properties, and to be honest, these are, this one here is almost impossible to actually measure, okay? It's usually assumed or done by measurement. We can actually see the critical radius when we're observing these things under the microscope. And we can also uh, determine our delta G star, so our critical uh, driving force, all right, or, or Gibbs free energy for nucleation to occur in the forward direction. Again, it's based on geometry and our associated energy factors. I'll just pause here and say, hopefully you can see that if we did change the geometry of our particle, okay, so still the same curves, okay, the rates at which these things would ascend or decline would also then change based on these very simple geometric relationships. What's the volume of a cube okay, versus its surface area? What's the volume of a plate versus its surface area? Or a needle versus its surface area? Okay, so the slopes of these would change depending on the geometry, and also the geometry is going to change the shape of this curve. Right. Basically anything other than a sphere becomes more difficult to nucleate. <clears throat> now, with this, okay, we can look at nucleation rates and things like that as well. So, statistically, the average number of spherical clusters of radius R at a given temperature, T, is given by this relationship. Okay, so here we're pulling in the Boltzmann constant to look at our nucleation rates. Okay, uh, sorry, the, the probability or likeliness of a nucleation to occur, a nucleation event to occur, and the radius to exceed the critical. Um, the critical rate is for nucleation. Right. I'm not too concerned about this one um, in terms of the exam, right? but we can, we can see here that we can statistically relate it to the Boltzmann constant. Okay. It's, a, it's a statistical event for homogeneous nucleation. All right. <clears throat> now, if the liquid contains a concentration, C0, of atoms, per unit volume, the number of clusters that have reached a critical size, okay, so the concentration of critical size nuclei, C star can also be given by this equation here. Right. So again, thinking about this fixed volume that we have, right, um, and the number of atoms that can reach a critical size at a given temperature. Okay. So through this we can actually um, back substitute and have a think about the volume fraction of our material at a given temperature that has transformed under equilibrium conditions. Okay, so that's what this equation can give us. The, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm just a, a bit confused. So that delta G star home, that's mm -hmm. the delta G from equation five on the previous slide? Delta G star, which is the critical free energy related to um, the formation of a particle of critical radius, yeah? And that's what the delta G home thing is? Yep, and that represents this point here. And I'm also a bit confused um, as to why we, when we get to equation six, why aren't we considering the uh, gamma factor in here? Because um, <laughs> we're now looking at
G of R, delta G of R, where it's included. Now once we are at you know, this, this critical size of nuclei, right, just the addition of a single atom to each of these clusters will convert them into a stable nuclei. Okay, so that's our tipping point. If this happens with a frequency, F0, and again this is just basic statistics with the Boltzmann equation, the homogeneous nucleation rate is given by nHOM, which is equal to our frequency factor multiplied by our C star. Okay? Again. This is probably going a little bit beyond what this course is, and Michael, or might be Michael Ferry anymore, covers this in um, phase transformations next year. Okay, in much more detail than I'm going over here. All right. How are we for time? Okay, with that, um, we might take a, a ten, our 10 minute break now. Okay, so your minds don't explode, and we'll get on to the heterogeneous case and then the solid solid case. Okay? We'll take 10 minutes and then we'll come back and kick off again. Uh, can we make a couple of community announcements during the break? Is that all right? Who are you? What do you want? We're from Matsoc. Okay. What are you going to announce? Uh, our event came up, so we have our ball in week nine, we have our board games night, and we're just introducing our new representatives. Okay, probably not an awesome turnout to do that, but sure, you're welcome. Yeah, because <laughs> no one turns up to lectures anyway. It's a, bit. it's a very bad habit. <laughs> Go for it. Um, microphone. Can we just chuck you this game? You're killing me, guys. Um, Sorry. Alright, we'll just do it. Yeah. Um, we don't really need the presentation. Sorry, yep. sorry about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, so, hi everyone. Uh, lovely for all of you to be here today. Uh, we're just going to make a couple of announcements. So, first up, we have our ball coming up in week 9, Thursday. Uh, yeah, just letting you know we have our second release out. And tickets are 170 per person. So, pretty cheap for a little bit of alcohol. board games. Um, there will be drinks, so you guys can come for drinks, or if not, you can, you guys can come for have fun, um, play some board, board games, hold some board games with your friends, um, do some stuff like that. Um, so, just one more thing, um, we had our AGM about two, three weeks ago, where we re-elected our year reps, and this year, for third year 2020, um, our year reps is Carlo and Regina, and they can give a brief introduction of themselves right now. I'm Regina and I'll be your third year rep for 2020 so we're here to uh, express your opinions to Maxop, Maxop team so that you have a better experience at uni. Yeah. All right. Thanks guys.
Guys, who's going to pass around the sheet to see who's still here? Okay. And we'll get on with our, um, our lecture set. <coughs> okay. Now, when we're looking at the case of a heterogeneous transformation, okay, and we're just going to look at the simple um, case of a mould wall, okay, in our solidification event. <coughs> now, the case is very, very similar. Okay, we've got energy factors associated with uh, the size of our solid particle. Okay. We've also got additional energy factors associated with um, interfacial energies between the liquid in the mould wall and the solid in the mould as well, okay. uh, which will restrict how, uh, how this particle can grow. Okay. So basically for a given volume of solid, the total interfacial energy of the system is minimised if the embryo has the shape of a spherical cap. So this is the assumption that we're going to make again for this spherical case. Okay. Um, this sphere is going to have a specific wetting angle, theta, given by the condition that the interfacial tension uh, is balanced in the plane of the mould wall. Okay? So essentially our interfacial energy between our mould and the liquid minus the interfacial energy between the solid and the mould Right here, minus the interfacial energy between the solid and the liquid, right, which is the same as in our previous equations, okay, multiplied by our wetting angle is equal to zero. Okay, so we're under an equilibrium condition. The formation of this type of embryo will be associated with an excess free energy. Okay, so here our delta G for heterogeneous uh, nucleation is going to be associated with the energy decrease associated with the change in the volume, okay, minus uh, the difference between the surface area, okay, between the solid and the mold wall, right, okay, overall giving us a, an energy decrease, plus, okay, this additional factor here where we're looking at the energy difference based on the surface area between the solid and the liquid, okay, so this is similar to our homogeneous case, so that's what that component there is, okay, with the additional component here of the area, the surface area between our, um, our solid and the mould here, okay. So we're just adding a few additional components here, okay, that are going to give us uh, the properties uh, our delta G hep, right, for the growth of a particle from a mould wall. And we can go through this in, in detail and work out our critical radius and things like that. Uh, but generally, these types of things are um, measured in the lab. Okay, so up in Vina's lab, she used to do a lot of work with steels, wetting angles of steels. She'd sit a droplet or a sphere of metal in a furnace, heat it up for 16 hours or whatever else, um, gradually, and monitor the change in the wetting angle. Okay. Uh, to see how her materials were um, interacting within the glass furnace right. and wetting the uh, refractory liners in the glass furnace. That was her experiment. All right. So a little bit hokey, okay, in terms of trying to understand it, okay. but it's there if we, if we need it. All right. All right. What we find, okay, when we start to substitute into this equation, is we get this increase here, all right, um, in our delta G uh, for homogeneous nucleation. Hang on. Uh, sorry. So this is relative. What what this what this does having these additional factors is basically decreases our delta G factor compared to our homogeneous case. All right. So in our last equation, okay, for the homogeneous case, all right. We've blown it up now and we can see here that our driving force, our critical radius is still the same, all right, but the free energy required to nucleate is much less. Okay? And this hopefully is what we're seeing in nature, okay, what we're observing. Heterogeneous nucleation in terms of energy is much, much easier than homogeneous nucleation if we have that site to play with. Okay. 
I'm not going to go through all of these equations here, but I, the general take this is the general takeaway that we get. All right, the heterogeneous nucleation. As I said, this is a good learning for you for phase transformations with Michael Ferry or whoever's teaching it now for next year. Okay, so the information's there if you're interested. The key takeaway: our delta G is much much smaller for heterogeneous nucleation. So classic nucleation theory is explaining what we see in nature in regards to a heterogeneous nucleation site. Right? Lower energy. Okay. <clears throat> now, the equations are basically the similar, uh, similar okay, to what they were before. Okay? But we do know now that this factor here is much, much smaller. Okay? So what we essentially get is um, uh, <clears throat> the number of nucleation sites will increase, okay, with this, all right, and I think the nucleation rate will also increase if we increase the number of um, heterogeneous sites, okay, and this was the example that we gave from uh, our lab, okay, providing this site, nucleation uh, will occur, okay, without these particles, this doesn't happen, full stop. And again, if we give a greater number of nucleation sites, and here's our example from Monday's class, if we add our inoculation particles, okay, without inoculation, we get this crystal structure, this number of large grains. With our inoculating particles, we're giving multiple sites uh, for nucleation to occur. Okay. So moving away from this liquid to solid event, okay. Now we're going to look at uh, another one that's very important to material science and probably your courses as you move through your degree, okay, in regards to classic nucleation, is this solid to solid transformation, okay. And a homogeneous transformation in solid to solid um, does occur in solid solid systems, all right. So we've seen a few examples where we get precipitation of a new phase from an existing phase when we change temperature based on the stability of that phase right. or even recrystallization. So basically all things here are similar to the solid liquid case apart from the fact that we've now got an additional term to deal with the interface energy from the solid to the solid. Okay? Um, there's an additional factor here and that's based on lattice mismatch. All right, so we'll go through the slide. So the barrier to solid state nucleation depends on the energy of the interface, gamma, created between the matrix and the nucleus of the new phase. Okay, so that's the one that's the same as in the solid liquid case. All right, it'll be a gamma SS, I suppose, in this case. There's also another factor now, which is the elastic misfit or strain energy per unit volume of precipitate. Right. So I mentioned it before, going from the liquid to the solid, building up that solid. Okay. So the liquid's flexible. Okay. It's random, it can be moved, it's got a viscosity. Right. Whereas when we're going from a solid to a solid, the atoms have to shift okay, or diffuse from the structure of one solid to the structure of another solid. So this is an additional energy requirement. All right. The misfit between those two phases okay, um, gives us an additional positive energy contribution to our system. So for the nucleation of a second phase, let's just call it beta, in an alpha matrix, the change in delta G is given by this equation here. All right. Assuming uh, gamma is an isotropic property Okay, with interface orientation and the nucleus is spherical with a radius of r, we can actually convert our equation 17 all right, uh, into this equation here. So the free energy or the change in free energy associated with this transformation from alpha to beta, so a solid precipitating, nucleating within another solid, is given by this general form of the equation. So this part here, it's identical to our solid liquid case. So the volume of our beta particle multiplied by our um, 
uh, the free energy associated with that volume, that phase, right? So again, that is this curve here, the pink one, plus our interfacial free energy, okay? Um, the sum of our interfacial uh, free energy. This is a multiplication of our area, okay, between our two phases. Uh, so the interface between the two phases uh, multiplied by <coughs> our gamma i, our interfacial energy, okay, which is again this part of the equation, right, plus this misfit strain energy here. Okay, so this is associated with the volume of beta that's forming. Okay, multiplied by free energy of, uh, I guess, the new, the new solid, okay, Gs. And when we combine those two, I think we've got our equations here, okay. When we combine them, we end up with <coughs> uh, this line here, yeah, plus the misfit strain energy. So basically having this additional misfit strain energy in our equation, mm -hmm we shift over to here, all right? So this here is essentially the same as that um, liquid solid transformation here, just the volume contribution, all right? But now we have this misfit strain energy as well, which is making a positive contribution, which is shifting um, our contribution to our main curve in more positive territory. So basically what that means is this hump is getting slightly larger compared to our um, our solid to liquid homogeneous case, okay? So the key takeaway here is that the lattice misfit associated between the two solid faces is giving a positive contribution to the free energy, making it slightly harder for nucleation to occur in a solid-solid interaction. Nucleation event. Okay. Pretty boring stuff, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, all over again, okay, we can determine the rates of solid state homogeneous nucleation in a similar form to the solid, uh, to the liquid solid event in equation A, okay. In this case, it's given by this example here, okay. We have this additional factor of Gn, okay, or we can rewrite that in terms of our volume. Right. Basically, delta GM in this case, okay, is equal to our activation energy term for diffusion. All right. So diffusion from a liquid is very, very easy. Yeah. The atoms are incredibly mobile; they can add on, move about very, very easily. Okay. So diffusion is essentially you, know, you could almost say 100% if you wanted to put some kind of value on it. In the solid, though, this isn't the case. Okay. It's very, very difficult for an atom to move about and diffuse within a solid to move over and turn itself into another solid. Right. Um, <clears throat> so C naught atoms per unit volume of the parent phase and omega is essentially a constant which is typically associated with the atomic vibration frequency. Okay. Again, this can be tied slightly to diffusion and diffusion rates. Okay. <clears throat> um, this here is an example from some of the work in our lab. Here we have two different phases. Okay. These phases are both FCC crystal structure. Okay. At high temperature, this phase here is the stable phase, right? uh, a disordered FCC phase. As we reduce our temperature, an ordered phase starts to nucleate and grow. All right. So this is basic phase equilibria. Now what we see in terms of our holding time, all right, uh, at an annealing temperature below that transformation temperature, okay, transformation temperature is uh, about 900 degrees centigrade in this system. Okay, we hold this at 850, very, very close to that transformation temperature, but below it, so it's going to happen. Okay, and over time, the secondary phase, um, the volume fraction doesn't change, okay, but the shape and morphology does as this thing's trying to minimize its surface uh, area. So over time, what we would essentially have is the same as that um, sphere, all right, in the middle of 
the parent phase. Okay, so over time, this would uh, this structure would try to minimise its um, surface area to volume ratio and form a single sphere of that phase uh, within the matrix. Now, I bring this one up because both of these phases are the same crystal structure, which means they're completely coherent. So the lattice misfit energy is incredibly low, right? and that's why we start to see these very, very random rounded shapes as opposed to faceted shapes that are coherent with a, a crystal plane or a specific crystal plane. Okay? So if the lattice misfit factor is very, very low, we do get spherical bodies growing very, very easily. The lattice misfit energy is high, so if this had a different crystal structure, then we'd start to see more faceted shapes, okay? because the atoms would only be compatible on certain planes, not every plane. Right. Okay. So using the example of this solid-to-solid -solid heterogeneous transformation, okay, um, so moving away from a homogeneous transformation, something occurring in the middle of a grain or something like that, um, we spoke on Monday how having local structural defects or sites of higher energy can affect nucleation in a heterogeneous way. And we spoke about grain boundaries being the key place for this to occur because the structural energy at the grain boundary is high. We've essentially got a very disordered structure okay, where two, three grains meet. All right. So their lattice don't match up anymore in this region. And the atoms that are actually in this region are just doing the best they can to bond to each other and those grains. Okay, so the grain boundaries are a source of weakness and they're a high energy structure. Right. <clears throat> so nucleation is sensitive to local regions that may have reduced local energy or higher diffusivity pathways. Okay, so I remember that solid-solid, this nucleation event, is also highly dependent on diffusion, getting one atom from point A to point B. We will learn in the next couple of weeks that grain boundaries are also like super highways for diffusion. Okay? There are larger gaps between these atoms. Okay? So it is easier for atoms to migrate along grain boundaries than it is to try to migrate through grain bodies. Okay? This also affects our nucleation. Right. So yeah, nucleation often occurs at these local structural imperfections related to the energy. Now there is a certain order of energy associated with these features as you can probably imagine. Okay. Remember this list here, this is quite important okay, and this is often looked at in the exam for one of the questions. Okay. When we look at grain faces, so what's a grain face? A grain face is where we have the face of one grain matching up to the face of another grain. Okay. It's essentially a two-dimensional structure. Okay. So we have an energy essentially associated with uh, a two-dimensional structure in the interface between two grains. Right? So that's the grain face. Of all these features, that actually has the lowest structural energy. Okay? And it's probably least likely for a nucleation event. Okay? The grain body itself is the lowest likeliness. Okay? So we're at the grain edge, uh, grain face. The grain edge is essentially where three grains meet. So if we have a solid grain, okay, three grains meeting up on edge. Okay, so now we have a misorientation factor associated with three grains okay, on a grain edge. So that means that this region here between the grains is going to be even more disordered, probably slightly wider okay, than a grain face. Right. So it's got slightly higher structural energy and is therefore a place where nucleation might occur um, more frequently than at a grain face or within the bulk body of the material. And we can keep going up, all right? So grain corners, where four grains meet, okay, in 2D, might look like this. You can appreciate here that the volume of these disordered atomic structures okay, is much, much larger than at a grain edge or what it would be for a grain face. <coughs> now, that's the order in terms of structural energy and where we're most likely to see um, nucleation of either a new phase or also in the case of recrystallization. Okay? Grain corners are a key site for these things to occur. We also see nucleation happening 
um, at intercrystalline defects. Okay? The likeliness is much, much lower because these defects are very, very small. All right? So an intercrystalline defect such as a dislocation or a stacking fault, it's essentially one atomic layer or one atomic plane. Okay? So it's very, very small. Okay? Or a vacancy, which is essentially just one atomic site. These sorts of sites would be responsible for the precipitation of things within the grain. And we can see quite clearly from this example that yes, it is happening within the grain. Okay? And in this alloy, there are a lot of different elements. You've got copper and magnesium in this alloy, the matrix is aluminium. But we can see the highest density of precipitation here is happening at the intersection of the grains. And then there's a slightly lower density of precipitation happening along these grain boundaries. We can also get um, uh, solid solid heterogeneous transformations occurring at the surface of foreign particles. And we did see an example there in the TEM where we had a foreign particle, okay, and obviously the surface of that foreign particle was um, either coherent, okay, or created a large stress within the structure that hadn't been there in the first place, okay, which allows for nucleation to occur at that interface between that foreign particle. Okay. Just remember this order here. Face, edge, corner. Bulk is essentially over here. All right. Okay. It's a little bit more difficult to uh, describe in terms of equations um, or components of equations. Heterogeneous nucleation when we're using particles and things like that in a solid solid transaction. Okay. So basically what people have done with classic nucleation theory is used kind of an inverse relationship or a subtractive relationship, okay? Here they basically say, okay, we can calculate the, um, uh, the free energy of a homogeneous transformation, all right? Now we're gonna look at the, the inverse of that and see what energy it would take to actually get rid of that defect, okay? The destruction of that defect. And we're going to call this our delta G um, for heterogeneous nucleation. All right. So delta G is this uh, release of free energy by the destruction of the defect, therefore reducing that activation barrier. Okay. And this is the only way that we can actually do it experimentally as well. Okay. We can define through energy, through temperature, um, and we can observe when a particular defect is being dissolved or being destructed. Okay, and we use that energy in our cal calculation okay, of delta G head. Okay, so again, it's very, um, it's very tricky to try and determine these things uh, in the lab because we're talking about the atomic scale, things that we can't necessarily see very clearly. Right. So again, and I'm gonna put this little order down here, okay, in terms of the energy and the likeliness of uh, nucleation, the solid-solid event. So the energy associated with a homogeneous nucleation event, so random, stochastic, and a solid-solid event, is um, greater than the energy required at a lattice defect, like a vacancy, or a dislocation, or a stacking fault, okay? which is greater than that at a grain boundary, okay, or a grain face, which is greater than at a grain edge, which is greater than a grain corner. Okay? So basically this order is associated with the size of that defect, all right, the number of disordered atoms locally for that event to occur at that site. So yep, it's probably most likely to happen at a grain corner than homogeneously within the bulk, of course. All right. Okay, so I think we've, we've covered this um, relatively well for the other sections. Again, I'm not really going to be um, looking too much at heterogeneous nucleation rates you will cover this in a course further down the track. But here it is, just in case you're interested um, in looking into it further, okay, in terms of classic nucleation. All right. no, I'm not gonna dwell too much on it. Basically, you kind of get, get the feeling for this now. The more nucleation sites that we have, the finer our grain size is going to be. All right. All right. Now, we have finished up a bit early today and that's mainly because I've just dumped a whole lot of equations and formulas and things on you. 
um, which I really do encourage that you try to understand and learn. Right. So as I mentioned, I think that key uh, set of slides is essentially one block of questions in your exam, maybe one and a half. All right. So that's very, very important. And this is kind of the main application of nucleation in material science. Okay. We look at it through classic nucleation theory, or try to define it through classic nucleation theory, but most of the time it's observed in the lab, okay, and then back calculated into these equations to try to define our delta Gs and our um, interfacial energies. Okay. And from those, we can then predict transformations, how fast they will occur in all these sorts of things if we change our undercooling or our temperature parameters. Okay. Uh, I expect a lot of questions on it, and I'll do my best. Um, if you're having trouble with it, uh, click me an email or come and see me in the office if you can catch me. But I will also say that um, final week or, or maybe week nine, no, week ten, we do have a large tutorial session where I will be going through the practice exam questions, and we will be covering this material again just to rejog your memory before the exam. That's where I usually get most questions about. Usually three or four hours before the exam. All right. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, um, next week, Monday, we'll be looking at crystal growth. Okay. So the other side of the coin, nucleation and growth. Just the liquid case, solid oh, yeah. liquid case. Yeah. Solid yeah. Liquid case. Yep. So you were talking about that's the um, homogeneous uh, critical free energy. Like yeah. For for the action, the reaction to move forward. Yeah. But I'm um, kind of confused with the blue one and the red one. There. So these are just the two components of our delta G calculation. So this one here, the blue one, is this component here, and it's always positive. It's trying to stop the reaction progressing. Right. This orange line here is this part of the equation. And it's always negative, so it's trying to proceed the reaction forward. Basically, this line here is just this one plus this one. Okay. Yeah. So because this one starts to move faster than this one, we start to get the total of that reaction event going forward. So it's more negative. Thank you. Free energies. Okay. So yeah, it's and, and they're labelled here. Okay. So that's our this component. Right. And this one here is this component to give our total free energy. And like the In terms of, of our the peak of that is just the critical. Yep. So that peak there, critical free energy, and the critical radius of that nucleus. Oh, and the radius. Yep. Thank you. Because yeah, we're doing it, this one down here. We're doing it in terms of radius. Okay. So volume of our sphere here is substituting for our v. Yeah. And our A is surface area. Okay, so the equation literally comes down to the rate of change of volume versus surface area as R increases. Great. Thank you. Yep. No worries. Hey. Um, I remember at the start of the term about the sample Yep. Okay. Um, I'm just wondering. I when we will find out. Yeah. I don't know when they announce this. This is um, so all exams now that are in the exam period. Um, essentially controlled and allocated. Mm -hmm. um, I sent when you did send me that. I sent um, a message to Michael, yep. uh, Michael Lai, because he's the one that usually would put in inquiries about this sort of thing. And he came back and said that typically they try to have um, exams with more than a hundred students in them mm -hmm. earlier in the exam period okay. to allow for marking and feedback. Yeah. So that's the only response that I got. Okay. Uh, so he. That, that will push for a class this size to have it earlier in the exam period. That's probably the best indicator I can give you. All right. I'm not sure when that's announced, but um, se send me another email so that I remember and yeah. I can ask Michael um, when it will be announced. Yeah, but okay. still, that, that mightn't even help you so much. When yeah. it's announced, it's announced, and we can't really control that. So if it is announced and I can't make it, there's not a possibility Which, of me doing it earlier? Um, what was the reason you were travelling was personal, wasn't it? Or was it for I'm the representing the uni. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, so, so, so that's, um, that falls under SC. You'd get a supplementary exam regardless. I'll try to do it later. You will, it, okay. it'll be timetabled to be later if you miss it. Yeah, okay. Um, were you early in the exam period or late in the exam? You were early, yeah, weren't you? Yeah, like first weekend. First weekend, okay. You might be back by the yeah, time you get Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So I just want to... Wait, wait for the announcement. Mm -hmm. You've given, did you submit the paperwork for SC? Special consideration? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that will have been approved very, very early on. I think I had another student in a similar boat. Mm -hmm. um, it's been approved. So okay. if the event falls on the event, you get the supplementary exam later on. So okay. usually the supplementaries will be, um, those supplementaries are again handled by Central. <laughs> so okay. I can't give you the date for them. Yeah. We just give them an exam and a supplementary exam. Okay. Um, they will timetable it usually one to two weeks after the fact. Um, it'll be before our exam meeting and the final submission of the deadline. So it'll be two weeks after whatever the regional exam would be. Okay, all right. All right. Thank you. Best I can give you That's information. Good. Thank you. Just a quick question. Um, yep. Uh, what's the relationship between free energy and the, the chances of mutation to occur? Because I don't really understand why is it like like in this order. I understand this one, mm -hmm. but I don't understand how homogeneous. So homogeneous nucleation in the solid. Yeah. This means it's trying to change. And I'll draw. I'll draw it on the board that we might help you. Right. So. Homogeneous nucleation in the solid means it's happening within the body of the crystal, right? So there's our crystal lattice, it's perfect. Okay. We've got atoms on each of these sides. For a new phase to nucleate in this perfect lattice, it takes an incredible amount of energy. So imagine that the new phase has a structure that looks like, and I'll just draw over the top of it, a structure that looks like this to actually happen, this atom is going to have to move, or this atom will move, have to move to here, that one will have to move there, that one will have to move there, um, this one here, this one here, perfectly and easily. And when that happens, there's going to be a huge, I'll just put the atoms in here, a huge mismatch between the existing atoms in the lattice now. The bond angles are all weird, yep. the lengths are all weird. That's a really high energy oh. way to try to nucleate and grow. Right. With the um, uh, with the lattice defects, that makes our life a little bit easier. So imagine, and I'll try and do it kind of three, three here, here we go, we have that, we have that, we have to take the plane away, so we've got that. So let's just say that this is a dislocation in our structure, which is essentially an extra half plane of atoms. Okay. So up here we've got some compressive forces, in here, here's some tensile forces because these ones are further apart than they should be. So straight away we've got a higher energy site. We've essentially got a, a vacancy here as well. Okay. So for this structure to try to introduce something, the energy associated with that is actually a little bit less. It's already strained, okay. it wants to reduce its structural energy, and for whatever reason, it might be easier to produce that structure here, okay. by having that defect present. Okay. So it is associated, just think about the energy and the size of the defect. Size of the defect is equivalent to the increase in the energy of the defect. The higher the energy, the more likely nucleation will occur. That's the definition. So here, zero, no defect. Yep. Perfect. Here, small defect. Right. Grain boundary, or grain face, a lot of in, uh, defects at yeah. the face. At the edge, even more. At the corner, the most. Oh, okay. okay. So that's this one here is by far the highest. Alright, thank you very much. Okay, no problem.